I want to thank, uh, once again, thank the Des Moines Register for uh, the time here on the stage. Let me start my clock. And I want to thank the Iowa State Fair for giving the Register uh, this space here so that uh, candidates for public office can speak with all of you. So, uh, as uh, Carol introduced me, my name's uh, Brian Jack Holder. I'm uh, almost 50 years old. I'm from Council Bluffs, Iowa. I've lived in Pot County my entire life. And uh, this is the fifth time I've run for Congress here in Iowa. Uh, they do the reapportionment every 10 years, and so the four previous times I've run, uh, I was part, uh, Pot County was part of the third congressional district, which includes uh, Des Moines and Southwest Iowa. But they just uh, reapportioned the state of Iowa, all the state, House districts, state senate districts, and the congressional districts. So now Pottawatomie County is part of the new fourth congressional district. And the new fourth congressional district, as you can see from this map, it's uh, the, the northwest corner of the state, but it's 36 counties. So it's more than a third of the geography of the state of Iowa that whoever represents the fourth district has constituents in 36 counties. And uh, something I've always advocated for on all these campaigns is for smaller congressional districts. A uh, hundred years ago, Iowa had 11 congressional districts, and now we're down to four. You know, we were very lucky we didn't lose a district here with the current reapportionment, but to uh, place uh, the decision-making power in one person's hands to make decisions for 800,000 of us uh, you know, to me, it doesn't seem very representative. Uh, the the two-party system is deeply entrenched, and so to win a race like the one that I'm in, I'd have to raise two, three, four million dollars. And what that does is it it puts uh, the opportunity to hold public office and to represent people uh, only in the hands of the very well-connected and the very powerful. And uh, you know, the the average person, the average citizen here should have as much say in what goes on in Washington and the policies that affect us. It shouldn't just be about a, an aristocracy, an oligarchy of a ruling elite that are completely unaccountable to us. Uh, you know, if any of you have ever gone to a town hall meeting with your uh, congressional representatives, oftentimes they, uh, they can only fly into town, drive into town, and they're there at your public library for 15 or 20 minutes. Well, that's, that doesn't cut it in terms of representation. These people are writing laws that affect our daily lives. Uh, they're writing laws that affect the economy. Uh, they affect foreign policy decisions. And it's time for all of us average folks that want to have a part in the political process to stand up. And, uh, you know, in Iowa, thankfully, you don't have to pay a filing fee to get on the ballot for public office. You just have to turn in a certain number of signatures. But, you know, there are certain offices in the state of Iowa where you don't have to turn in any signatures. All you have to do is fill out an affidavit of candidacy, and you can get your name on the ballot. And I think that's uh, the more democratic way to go, is just... Uh, and, you know, whoever has the most money and the most organizational skills is going to win most of the races. But uh, I think you get a better uh, process. We get a better government when there are more choices for us. You know, I had to form a, what I call the Liberty Caucus, which is, it's just me. But uh, Liberty Caucus, it's also a process to get on the ballot. So last year, my friends in the Republican Party... They uh, increased my burden and your burden to run for Congress by 400%. Now, there was no compelling governmental interest to do this, to make it more difficult. We have so few independent and third-party candidates that run for statewide and federal office that, uh, you know, it was sort of ridiculous. But some of the Republicans blame me for the, the two losses of their Republican candidate in the 3rd Congressional District. And so... It was sort of their way to uh, prevent me from running again. But uh, I wasn't able to get uh, the new signature requirement, which is roughly 2,000 signatures to get on the ballot. So I thought to myself, you know what? No one in Iowa has gotten on the ballot for Congress as a, as a caucus candidate. So I created my own organization, and I started caucusing back in December. And so I had to have at least 200 people attend my caucus. Well, I had 
more than that, way more than that. But I did have to turn in a list of those in attendance to the state of Iowa. And unfortunately, the Republicans and Democrats, were they to nominate through a caucus process, they don't have to do that. They don't have to give the state a list of attendees. And so that's a complete violation of equal protection because it creates a double standard that our law forbids. So, you know, there's lots of problems in the world. And in the uh, 14 minutes I have left, I'm not going to uh, be able to solve them. But uh, there's some things I'd like to say. First of all, there's some of us that are never going to accept any mandatory vaccines. Some of us have neurological problems, uh, but we have good immune systems. So I didn't take the jab, and uh, I would not force anybody to take the jab. But I have friends that lost their, uh, they lost their jobs. They've lost their, uh, I have a friend at Creighton Law School that he had to take the in, uh, injection just to stay in law school. And as someone that graduated from law school, he really had no choice. You know, he'd gone to law school, he'd gone to undergrad for four years, law school for two, and in his last year, they gave him the decision, either get the injection or you lose your, your doctor of law degree. So that's completely wrong. The origins of the, the coronavirus, well, if you look out there in the media, there's uh, competing narratives about how this pandemic started, how it came about. And I don't trust uh, certain people that uh, have a vested interest in claiming it was caused by an animal or whether it was something man-made and leaked from a lab. But we need to have a blue ribbon panel, just like the Congress had the Warren Commission that investigated the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, I think there needs to be a, a committee to investigate the sources and origins of the pandemic. Moving on to another issue, the war in the Ukraine. You know, I don't, uh, I don't believe that uh, we should be there sending them weapons into a war zone with a nuclear power on the other side, but uh, that's the way our government has operated uh, for at least the last hundred years or so. They, they like to have these proxy wars with other major powers. Now, the trouble with that is in this day and age, with a nuclear-armed adversary, uh, they could destroy the entire world. You, you would hope cooler heads would prevail, but as we saw during the Cuban Missile Crisis, that uh, the whole thing, uh, World War III nuclear war may have been averted just because a Russian submarine commander had the courage not to launch. So, you know, our, our whole lives shouldn't depend upon one person's poor or bad decision. It shouldn't, our, our lives should not be hanging in the balance. So, you know, and I'm still registered a libertarian. I would have loved to have been the Libertarian Party nominee and have the word libertarian on the ballot next to my name for this election. But with the Republicans doing what they did to increase the threshold to get on the ballot, unfortunately, I was unable to do that. But my friend Rick Stewart, wonderful guy. I'll be voting for Rick in November. He was able to organize a, a group of people that helped him get those 4,000 signatures. He needed 3,500, and I know he turned in over 4,000, and he got a lot of those himself. So, you know, those signature requirements, they don't mean anything unless the candidate themselves is out there getting them. Go right ahead, sir. I got a question for you, sir. Yes. The, the trouble with the public education in this country, well, I know a little bit about public education. I was educated through public schools through the eighth grade, uh, but uh, even better than that, my dad was a school teacher, he was a high school guidance counselor, and he finished his career as a school principal in the public schools in Counts Bluffs. And the biggest obstacle to achievement in public schools was not having a solid foundation uh, of a family at home. Uh, having single parent families, it, it's not good on the upbringing of the, the kids because of the fact that uh, one person, one parent is doing everything to try and help the kids get educated, get them fed, uh, get them housed and clothed. So, you know, if we can, if we can have policies that uh, support and strengthen the nuclear family. 
Well, I'm not sure if uh, one congressperson is going to solve the broken family problems in this country. But, uh, you know, there's church attendance is down in this nation. There's a lot of people that uh, no longer attend church. Uh, and there's been a, a subsequent increase in the number of service agencies that have uh, been formed to help out these families, to help subsidize them and to help take care of them and help address their needs and concerns. So, you know, it's always good if the free market solutions come about to, to help people. But, you know, they tax us and they spend money on certain programs. Spending uh, billions of dollars on bullets and bombs for the Ukraine, uh, I don't think that's a, a wise and useful uh, disbursement of our public funds, you know. But, you know, the way our public funds work, the government doesn't, uh, they really don't need our money anymore from our paychecks. They don't need to tax us with the income tax because the government creates money from nothing. It's called fiat currency. They create money out of thin air and then they disperse it to different programs, different businesses, different corporations. But if you look at the, the state of the country, we basically live under a form of corporatism. It's a form of fascism where the private corporations own our elected representatives. And that's uh, completely, completely uh, against everything that this country was founded upon. This country was founded upon the individual rights. And the, the founders, you know, a lot of them owned slaves. They, they were horrible people for doing that. And, uh, but we live in a country now where, look at me, I don't have millions of dollars. I'm running for Congress a fifth time, and I'm up here at the state fair, the Iowa State Fair, the greatest fair in the country. And the corporation, the Des Moines Register, has given me 20 minutes to speak here with you. So, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to get out there and voice our opinions, to speak with our fellow citizens. And I think that if more of us can run, it will give other people hope to get involved. I've got so many friends that have gotten involved in politics over the last eight years uh, like I have. And many of them have run for public office and some of them have even won successfully uh, offices at the county and state level. So, uh, you know, I want to invite Governor Reynolds to come here before the state fair is finished to speak with all of you like I am because, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy getting up here. But I'm sure that if she came and, and spoke that a lot of people would turn out to support her. And similarly, I want to invite uh, Randy Feenstra, who's the current 4th Congressional District Representative, to come and speak here. Uh, the last I checked, he's not scheduled to speak here yet, but I think uh, we need to take every opportunity that we're given to communicate with our fellow citizens because, uh, you know, it's only through talking about these very highly controversial and divisive issues that we can, we can reach common ground. And I want the common ground for us to reach to not to be Lexington Green and Concord Bridge and Antietam, you know. Whether you disagree or agree with some person, some politician or some policy, we all have to live together. You know, the election will be over on uh, November 8th and November 9th, we're all gonna have to join together. Now, I know there's so much focus on the presidential race here in two years and the top of the ticket, but these congressional races that I've run in before are just as important. Every bill originates, the tax and spending bill originates in the U.S. House of Representatives. So, you know, your, your chance to uh, influence the outcome of the discourse greatly increases if you can get on the ballot and you can run for public office. So... Well, I've got about five minutes here. I'm going to take any, any last questions, if anyone has them. Any questions? Go ahead, Bobby. Okay, yeah. Bobby asked me if, uh, and Bobby's running for Iowa House District 15 as a libertarian in western Iowa, uh, Pottawatomie County and Harrison County. So... If, uh, if we divided the districts up, like I propose, uh, they stopped adding seats 100 years ago, and the population has tripled. I call it the Iowa Compromise. Let's just divide by three. Divide their staff, 
divide the congressperson's salary by three and also divide that million dollar office budget by three. So let's get smaller districts and government closest to us. But like Bobby says, we'd have, uh, Iowa would have 12 representatives instead of four if they divided by three. Now that also means states like California, who has, I believe, 53 U.S. representatives, well, that would be tripled to 150. But uh, because each district must be roughly the same uh, size population. Uh, the Supreme Court issued an opinion decades ago called, uh, I believe it's uh, Reynolds versus Sims, where one person, one vote. So, but there's states like Wyoming where they have one U.S. representative. And so uh, a race like that out there, it's a statewide race. And they've got 450,000 people in the state of Wyoming. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'm going to uh, leave you with this one final thought here, and that's, uh, what do I want to say? You know, I've run for Congress. This will be the fifth time. This is the last time I'm going to run for Congress, but it's not, last, not the last time I'm going to run for public office. I have a, uh, a state senator who due to the redistricting, he's gonna be my state senator next year, and nobody in the new district voted for him in this newer constituency. And so I'm gonna to have to file a lawsuit against the state of Iowa to trigger a special election for Iowa Senate District 8. Uh, this current state senator, he voted to make it more difficult for us to run for office, and for that very reason alone, he didn't increase his own burden to get on the ballot, but he did increase mine and yours. So he should not be in, in the state Senate, but the state Senate and state House seats should be smaller districts too. So uh, our current state House districts are about 33,000 people. Our current state Senate districts are about 60 some thousand people. And it's, it, like I've said before, it's ridiculous to think one person can adequately represent tens of thousands of people. So. All right, well, I want to thank you all for coming out here to the Iowa State Fair. Uh, I want to thank you for listening to me here. And if you can do anything, uh, you know, in the next few, few months, just make sure that your friends and family that uh, have any problems, uh, you, you contact them, you try and help them however you can, uh, because this country has a lot of problems and they're not going to be resolved unless uh, we commit ourselves to that. So thank you very much.